Fruit of the World Tree Written by Not Six But Seven Any and all trademarked characters, names and places are not owned by the author or myself. All rights are reserved by the appropriate parties. Loki, God of Mischief, heir to the throne of Jotunheim and Prince of Asgard, has been enjoying the fruits of his labour. Sitting as the king of Asgard, under the guise of Odin perhaps the only downside, he releases a prisoner from the cells whom has no name or record for their crimes. He is met with a living corpse, with memory of days of old. Those memories are fractured, her power seemingly minute. So what does she bear that warrants incarceration? Whatever the knowledge she bears, or the power she contains, he wants to know it. Yet even before time to recover from ages of neglect, there is fire within enough to withstand even the chill of a frost giant. Quiet had returned to the world. It was not the quiet of birds and trees asleep, nor was it the silence of a room of hushed people awaiting a performance. Such a profound lack of sound existed within that it could consume others. Once or twice something beyond the walls made a vibration in the air that it felt like it might make a sound. Yet either her ears long ago had failed to receive sound, or nothing came of it at all. There was a time once where a voice she had heard, not through her ears but some place within, remembering that the vibrations of those words made, so she interpret within the silence of her room, until they too vanished. It was this memory of some time past that was remembered, when sound assaulted her, and though it was barely above a whisper, it was an abuse all the same. Shh. Sitting in the chair within the room, an empty expression viewed each small article that exists within. The bed she slept, a chair that she sat, an entire table which used to rock, yet even that had been silenced by pages of a book long memorized. My dear, no need to panic. Confusion, the first emotion she felt in ages. It touched her features as her palm slid across the table to stand up. You finally become aware of my presence. Amusement suffused the deep, articulate voice as she stopped in the middle of the space. Within the space, a cell, was artfully hidden in plain view. From within, it was like others, mostly empty save a few trinkets aged older than to be expected and without an empty cell. Have you come to kill me? Long, unruly hair lay loosely bound on the braided thread, the same colour as her bedding. The dark hair was without highlight, and skin nearly as clear as glass, indication of the length of her sentence. The voice replied, I've been watching you, quite intensely for the last couple of months. The light exists, not a ray came into those black eyes, which did not bother to peer about. They simply accepted that suddenly her world was populated by another. Oh yes, I've been that shadow in the corner of your dreams. The ones you're afraid to tell any one of those imaginative constructs of your mind which have kept you sane these many years. The ones where you submit to your lustful need. Who are you to judge what I dream? She peered at the artifacts of her imprisonment, and she no longer knew who brought them, or if they'd always been hers. Amused, further the voice replied yet again, You don't remember, but you were calling out my name in them, my dear. And what did I name you to call you? A strange sensation plod a course across her skin, the exact name of it not possible, because it was many, and all of them had been forgotten. It pricked the hairs on her arm to stand rigid, and for the first time she could hear her own breath. Something had affected her enough for her heart to beat so even she could hear, afraid that it had been stilled long ago. 
rather than a response, a wall which had always been and bore no lock or lever or window, vanished to a dark place. The walls beyond were lit by flames that she could not see, but knew they exist for the flickering of the light. Her feet moved not from that place where she had stopped within, questioned by a voice she did not create. Though time had passed enough for her dreams to populate nations, none bore a voice like this, though it came from inside her head, nevertheless. For a moment, she was frightened, and when a touch of something chilled her, thoughts snapped into quick focus. Though nothing exists but her world in this stone and brick place, she flinched back a step and noted the slight scent new to her. It was cool and heavy, a thing she once had a name for, but couldn't recall. Finally, she heard a distant sound. It was indistinct, yet there it was. What was it? Unstopped and invisible, she lay an uncovered foot outside the wall that had been and was no more. Two directions exist, one extending far and the other no distance at all. She chose the shorter of the two, touching the stone beside her as a guide to the corner. The eyes in her head adjust to the change of light. Rooms like her own world, standing side by side a great length on both sides. Each lay empty. They must appear empty from the outside, she swore, and that was why no one came to this place, and no guard was needed. Struck with choice, she didn't know what to do. She hovered holding the wall a long while and tried to imagine what could be, what would be, beyond this place. Yet nothing seemed to hold any value or substance. Another ripple crossed her flesh, hair standing at attention again, or feeling intensely goaded to move the longer she wait. Closing her eyes to block out her vision and clear her head did not disband the feeling which threatened to unseat her, even as she stood. And she took a step. Free from her support, a free agent, she wanted to see what may follow up the stairs. Even from her place she could tell the world looked different there. Would it be more beautiful than the gardens of her mind? Did this place have denizens with dreams their own? Each stair provided a release from the unease invading her limbs, until a door blocked her path. This one bore the likeness of a real door, hinges and handle that felt real when her fingers grasped it, and it opened with barely a touch. Grandeur. Grandeur the like she could not create lay in the tile underfoot, and the wall stretching high. The ceilings bore paintings and colours that actually stung to see. Faster now her breath came. It kept beat with the drum in her chest, and by those two she stepped in tune. She followed at first the stone from below, and now the golden hues of the walls, because beyond them she heard better that sound. It was unknowable, but it was louder. A barrier, unlike the ones before, came closer. Another door, grand and ornate, yet the frame was made of frost or glass. It was cold when she touched it, some silvered light that was just as cold begging to be seen, yet she paused, her hand falling away from the handle. Is this madness? she questioned. Have I broken apart inside, shattered, and so I've become lost in my own mind? No voice replied to give answer or direction, but some kind of logic spoke that if she were mad, could anything behind these doors cause her harm any more? Resolved by the comforts of a delusion, she pushed the door, this one more resistant, and withstood the assault of cold air. Nearly in an instant, a sob destroyed the numb detachment that had carried her this far. It surprised her and was followed by another. Around her lay a vast place with too much detail to take in. The air moved around her carrying a pleasant smell and further ahead water flowed. It was such a gentle stream that the water did not break at the surface. It was like reality distorted, 
warping what lay below into different shapes. That had been the sound she heard. She was surrounded by streams and ponds, small puddles and pools that were crystal clear and littered with flowering shapes wreathed in green. Overwhelmed, she tilted her face up as if gravity could keep the tears inside, yet her eyes grew wider still. The very universe lay stretched above like a mass of tapestry, stars so many that surely it must be fake. Touched once more by the wind, she wavered now, overburdened by everything. The ground underneath her slanted upwards like the world was falling apart, though it was just her. Unable any longer to stand, her chin dipped down even as she slipped back into the breeze. The world once more became dark. Waking was slow. A heaviness weighed down on her limbs and she wondered numbly if she were dying. Uncomfortable under the weight was a warmth that at first was relief, but soon was too warm and growing. Stirred enough, her arms gave way first and eyes saw only a soft pink colour. She owed nothing pink, so she pulled away, head sliding out of the blanket draped over her. Unable to explain where she was or how, she sat upright and surveyed the new space around her. Gilded in gold and soft colours, it could only be described as elegant. Pale lengths of curtain hung from the ceiling in pink and white that matched the bedding around her. The material was unmarred by time and use. No threads lay sticking out or broken in it. Her hand felt it with a curiosity saved normally for the extraordinary. An invasion on her senses caused her to sit not unlike a wild animal spotted. Her breath became shallow, ears unable to pick apart that small nuance of this place which had disturbed her. You are getting better at that quite quickly. Startled that the voice came from not in her head but bounding off the pillars and floor, she shook free of the bedding. Animal instinct had awoken. Won't you join me? It said further and she realized that as clearly as this place had changed, also had her clothes. It was plain compared to the room around her, nothing more than a cream shift, yet it was warm despite being thin. Alerted now, awake like she had not been in many years, her feet placed firmly rather than the sweep of listless existence afforded by her fell. She forgot the garden with pools and stars from before, and walked about the long room, she noted daylight, a pale blue sky outside, but did not let it distract her. You're getting closer. Stalled. She wasn't sure she wanted to follow this invitation, and found her left foot decided for her. Sliding back, though she saw no sight that could be dangerous, she got the sense of amusement, nevertheless. Backtracking towards the bed, she found another way, a door, and she took that instead. Away from the voice in the blue sky, sounds from before memory, she found herself nearly at a run. Not a single soul walked these massive halls, though sense dictate that such a structure would surely be home to someone. Many someones. Fully at a run now, her heart a painful beating in her chest, she took any direction that called her first. She could not keep this up for long, feeling the effect of years nearly dead preventing her from carrying out her will. When next she took a corner, it was wide, her hands running against the wall to stop her from tripping up. The moment she was sure she wasn't a fall, eyes back to directing her steps, she stopped hurriedly, a pillar grasped to slow her. Down the hall, opening into the outside which she had run from before, was a stream of people, she heard their voices, different ones mixing, so many that she couldn't tell them apart. It didn't matter that they were men and women, a few children even. Fearful of something made her note the door across her, and inside of it she ducked, closing the door quickly. I may not be fond of many people, but then again, I'm not freshly escaped from prison. The voice had a spinning 
She found no one speaking to her in her ear, and she pressed herself against the door, hands stretching out as if in the dark once more. Fright caused her voice to crack, the anger of feeling toyed with too small to give her strength. "'Who are you?' she asked, though in her mind she was quite demanding. "'Who alive does not know the ruler of Asgard?' A chuckle came from every direction, making her head ache. "'You are not Odin,' she levelled her voice and breathed, while feeling the ache of her bones. "'But he was the one that locked you in that cell, then?' Beside her, the voice whispered, and she tore from the door into the centre of the room. "'Do sit,' it told her. Indignant, she waited on her feet for a time, until she succumbed to fatigue. Knowing she was going to have to rest, she chose to do so with some grace. Waiting for something to happen took more energy than she liked. That kind of vigil no long-term imprisonment could maintain, and finally when she felt she must be insane, a figure stepped out from beyond the couch. Who are you? This time her words held conviction and remained even keel. She tracked the lie's form as he wordlessly sat across her, a leg crossed at the knee. The ruler of Asgard, though the crowds revere me under the name Odin, clearly I am not. Loki sat across the neglected and malnourished woman with severe curiosity. His time in the cells below taught him many things, Mostly useful traits like patience, but sometimes abstract things like how long one lived inside those cells. It wasn't very long. He had considered himself an exception to this clause, those brightly lit rooms holding vagrants or assailants, but seldom a woman. More seldom, for the length that could run the skin of this woman before him translucent. Blue veins brought roads under her skin as clear as if drawn on. A dark ring under her eyes made her look gaunt and ancient, but it was her voice that proved that she was much younger, and all the more curious he pondered the riddle. Her silence allowed him to continue, though he found her reproach almost rude. I'm curious. What manner of power you contain that you've lived so long that history does not even aid you to know who I am? I myself was locked up for a short while in comparison, and I assure you, I am much more of a threat. Who are you then, truly? she asked. Loki laughed then. Which title was most likely to stir memories, he thought. I am Loki, god of mischief, prince of Asgard, heir to the throne of Jotunheim. He waved a hand gesturing to all that he stood power over. When no look of surprise or even acknowledgement greeted her, he leaned forward, disturbed in turn. You don't know who I am. Asgard has no prince, was all she replied, no longer feeling as worried. Apparently this upstart impostor thought he could play with fire, but she was not absent of all of her memories, distant as these one felt. I assure you it does, which begs the question how long has this seemingly powerless woman than host to a cell. And why? I don't think I need to answer a liar and a thief. While I'm grateful that my surroundings are much improved, my good nature ends there, I'm afraid. Even now in the light of a room, with windows thrown open, gentle sounds of people beyond, no light touched this woman's eyes. Afraid you should be. Shifting into a more familiar form, Loki took on the guise of Odin, resulting in the woman recoiling with almost a hiss. To all the known world, I am Odin. So when I ask questions from here on, I expect a simple answer. Your misguided anger can remain tightly sealed behind your teeth. Laughter, not his though, filled the room. It was impressive only because the strength she lacked in form did not in mind. I grant you, you have skill in whatever this is. However, I'd rather go back to my cell and rot. It was not Odin that placed me in the prison below, and I warn you, if you keep me free, I will not help you in no fashion whatsoever. Run along, little prince. 
I think I would have you locked up for just your ugly countenance and rude tongue. But if not Odin, then who would bother to lock you up? I assure you, my patience is worn quite thin. As Loki spoke, he stood up once more and slowly came near. With each step around the table, his face changed into another's. And my curiosity is fading. Switching from Odin, he became Heimdall, a generic knight, each of the warriors three and Sif, Frigg, Thor, and paused as all manner of expression drained out of her face. Thor, he said. He stalled there at his brother, but the woman recovered and he flicked back after a moment to his mother. Shoulders dropping, a look of pure destitute apathy washed over the woman. Loki's head turned to the side, curiosity renewed. Stop this game, she told him, and it was ignored most properly. Loki's entire form became his mother's. Eyes pinned shut, trying to keep the feeling of being upended, she breathed out a long sigh full of some pain and spoke more sadly than he expected. You have overplayed your hand now, Loki. Even if you could overpower Odin and take his place with your powers of illusion, you would never be able to pull it off and fool the Queen's eye, you hack. A moment of quiet in the room was allowed before Loki spoke again. It lacked any of the previous flourish and pomp, and was quite dull. My mother is dead. Peerless eyes took him in, and he smiled even before she stood up and lunged. His form returned to his own, and he caught the woman, twisting her around so she couldn't so much as scratch as all feral cats did when cornered. You lie! You lie, and I will kill you for speaking it! The attempts to struggle were so pathetic that he rolled his eyes and then propelled her forcefully forward towards a mirror which hung on the door. She screamed, putting all of her weight into his hands, and she kicked. Her arms were pinned around her chest by just one of his, and with the other he held her face, barely anything but bones now, and hateful eyes. Let go, she demanded. Pay attention, you simpering excuse for a living creature. Quiet, she still struggled, eyes squeezed shut against reason. Her face she pulled back as much as she could, her spirit of fire. Quit this futile display and... As quickly as she had lunged to strike him, Loki dropped her. He glared in a front at his hand now, which clenched shut, and looked back at her as she tried to right herself. He slapped her. Reeling, she did not stand again, and for a moment... He felt the closest to regret over a loss of temper. Summoning his thoughts, he stared a moment at his hand, which was bleeding, dark blue blood spiralling around his thumb. He considered returning the blighted woman to her cell, to be forgotten for all time. However, it passed quickly enough that he would amuse himself further instead. Sitting in his throne, master of his people, Loki watched a small music arrangement meant to entertain him. Bored, and having nothing to exercise his wit, it was a small price to pay for a kingship. The wind instruments thrilled, strings singing a halting vibrato, and all the while his mind was engaged in idle plans to redecorate aspects of this kingdom in his own honour. When even this no longer drew his attention, he waved his hand absently, sending the people from the throne room in quick succession. A lone finger tap on the arm of the throne, the sound piercing in the quiet. Then with a quick cock of his head he decided it was time to wake the enigma dragged out of Odin's cell a month prior. His steps down the hall were light, his swagger nothing like Odin's stoic pace, but entirely more comfortable. It took perhaps five minutes at this pace that would be jarring for an aged and worn old man, but that wasn't really the case as he sauntered up to the door housing his guest. Once inside, the illusion of Odin melted away, and he first admired the decent view from the balcony before he passed. Smiling down at all of Asgard, it carried even as he stood beside the bed, a halo of flickering haze encasing the woman. That was one thing that currently bothered him to no end. Of the records of prisoners, including his own, nothing marked the cell that housed this person. No name, 
and he had not asked for one before she turned feral. He was sure of this, that she bore some kind of power, and it was this that sustained her rather than any intervention of the guards. Though he couldn't say for sure from a lack of aiding someone in recovery, he was once more curious that a month under his care had not completely corrected ages of neglect. Please do try to remain civil this time. His recommendation was met with a furrow of brow. Rather than what would have passed as a decrepit woman of ancient times, he found after a week that she was of a much younger age, in form at the very least. After two weeks, it was quite clear as cheeks filled in and became supple, eyes no longer sunk in, and rather than having a figure as much as an eleven-year-old boy, it turned out she was actually female when before he'd merely guessed. I think a month should be time enough for recovery. Entertain me, girl, with your story now. Slow to rise, a much improved woman sat up. She groaned against being roused, or perhaps indignation of his company, but it hardly mattered. When she did stir properly and glare, his back straightened, a measure of unease touching his opinion of her. She clenched her teeth at looking at him, and looked down at the pink bedding once more. You can have nothing more to say to me, nor do I have anything to speak to you about. Her tone was flat and biting. Loki looked down the length of her, though seeing nothing extraordinary before. He turned and paced a lazy route around the room, thinking. Have you always been so unruly and ungrateful, or am I just so lucky to have earned your ire? If I recall, I've done nothing of ill repute against you, and you seem to hold me in rather backwards esteem. From the corner of her sight, he watched her review the skin of her arms, which was well improved to her previous state, though she said nothing of it in thanks. This irked him. Some would call me a saviour, I'll have you know. She gaped at him then, and laughed most sarcastically. <laughs> I don't recall asking for anyone's assistance, nor to be manhandled and mistreated. And what would a living corpse know of mistreatment? You sat in a cell, rotting. Forgotten. His expression calmed quickly, and Loki stood tall again, and then sat at the arm of a chair nearby. What is your name, woman? He was met with a blank stare to his question. Slowly the posture she held gave way to something looking like self-pity. I don't recall, she admitted. He chuckled and smirked, too wide to be innocent. I'm tired of calling you woman. From now, I suppose... Dottle. She scowled in clear horror. No, was her quick answer to that. Hilda. To which she replied, try again. Gunhild. Something not insulting, she said, knowing he was choosing on a bias. He thought a second longer this time, and with confidence said, surely, Yersa. Call me Erica, or keep with woman. Your taste in names is atrocious. She claimed with finality, and Loki found her choice interesting considering how old she may be. Any reason to why Erica? Erica pulled the blanket from her and stood from the bed not unlike any young petulant girl might. Because I don't care to be called a bear or a fighter. I'm neither, clearly. He made an expression of strong disagreement, and Erica began opening and closing drawers and dresses. Oh, I do hope you aren't thinking of leaving. She paused, arms dropping to her sides, and looked at him. And why not? You did not place me in there, and clearly Odin no longer reigns as all father. What do you care about my existence? When she turned to speak pointedly, she looked at Frigg instead, her next tone quickly changing as quickly as Loki's face. Why are you doing this? The guys fell away to a most serious regard for her existence. Because your incarceration raises many questions, and I'm in the habit of knowing all the answers. Be plain, and I can return you to the cell to die out your life if you so desire. Undaunted by the woman even recovered, Loki paced until he stood well inside her circle of comfort, larger than the normal person, as it were. I have never seen anyone quite with eyes like you, save one, and the resemblance is uncanny. 
Oddly, he claims not to know you, have ever met you, but we know he has very good sight. Do you always talk in annoying riddles? Her words may have been biting wit, but she lacked the presence of mind to control her body and expression. It gave her unease away, and so he stayed there, setting her off balance. It's called eloquence, my dear. Do try it. I don't like you, she said flatly, and he replied without hurt. Most don't. Now I happen to believe that you don't recall something as important as your name, mainly because it isn't important. You do, however, seem to have a recollection of events to the past, letting me know just how long you were in that cell. What I want to know... Oh. Erica sucked in her bottom lip, which had been chapped, and felt sick while Loki continued. You said before that Odin did not place you in that cell. However, you had quite the reaction to seeing my mother. What's curious in that is you seemed rather furious when I mentioned that she was dead, like that was an insult to you. A step closer, and he allowed that she had at least had courage, as misplaced and misguided as it was. Now let's wear this carefully, and I warn you, I will know if you lie to me. I do not recommend it. So. From what I've gathered, you don't seem too bothered by that place. I never even heard a word from your cell, and I was its neighbour, so yes, I would know. So what crime did you commit that you would willingly accept incarceration? Erica did not keep his eye, though another clear look at them may or may not help figure out this puzzle. Exhausted in a way that sleep did not cure, she placed a hand over her forehead as if suffering a common headache. I didn't commit a crime, she said. The rubbing of her fingers and thumb into her head led him to believe that this was true. He goaded her to continue. Then falsely accused... His words made her snap irritably, setting her jaw firmly to speak her mind. I am not a criminal. I was not falsely accused of a crime, was associated with any criminal, nor anything else that you can think of. I went to be forgotten. I was placed there to be forgotten. Are you pleased with yourself? I am no great mystery. I am a victim of the mundane, of a broken heart. I would believe that. If I didn't know better, he said smoothly, invading the innermost circle of personal space she could have, Loki bent and spoke into her ear directly. My mother would not have imprisoned an innocent woman, that much I do know. And as he had her ear now, she also had his. Put me back in my cell. Surprised at her gall, he pulled away before smiling in such a way that it was clear he was untrustworthy. Why? When I am having so much fun. Four days of solitude made Erica ponder her predicament. The first day she expected Loki to show up at any moment and begin to prod at her life and story. When he didn't, she attempted escape the next day, hoping he had grown bored in fact, as he seemed the type to perhaps forget. She slowly grew used to the sounds around her, for even the smallest of them before had rendered her unable to think, let alone plot. Sadly, when she stepped outside her door the second day, she found a pair of guards, and before saying anything, she returned to her room. Unfortunately, the balcony was not an option, as the uncounted floors above the gardens below, and it was not one filled with pools or one she could reach, and trust to be deep enough to cushion an ill-fated leap. Loki, on the other hand, was hardly idle all the while. He scoured a myriad of ancient texts for any other known cause of golden-covered eyes. When he first loosed the woman from her cell, they were as black and empty as any well of ink. Recovered, however, she boasted clearly some power that she was either keeping hidden or knew nothing about. Considering that she claimed to be nearly as old as his mother, it was clearly the first. They did not seem similar to Heimdall in anything but colour, but it was hardly the sight of a normal Asgardian. 
Having scoured such texts and scrolls, his academic side had worn thin and called an end to the physical search. It was clear that when she walked into imprisonment, it was with all knowledge of herself. While he had lied about inquiring about her to Heimdall himself, it was not unlikely that he didn't know about her being there. So why? Why did so many allow the condemnation of an innocent woman? If kept for her power, he certainly would find out what use it was. He wasn't against false imprisonment, considering the condition of Odin, but there was a vast something odd he couldn't put his finger on. As that was the case, he planned to ignore the woman for a good while until, of all things, he spotted her walking about the halls. He hadn't actually barred her from walking about, hoping to give her a taste of a life he could later hold over her head. But she was alone, unguarded. He had obviously given other orders to her confinement, but they were not being observed in any fashion. Do you like my grand halls? A flickering of green light had meant no sound, and he spoke after the illusion was fully formed. He leaned against a massive pillar the breadth of eight men, with all manner of mastery and beveled design and elegance. It is not how I remember it, she told him, and he allowed that was possibly a slip of her tongue. He let it go unquestioned so she might continue. The colours are different, but I suppose much was read back then. Try and decipher all you wish. I have no intention of giving you any information of me. He slipped from the pillar and into Odin's skin to wander about without confrontation. This made her very uneasy, but she spoke nothing of it. I do wonder how you escaped unarmed guards. Perhaps their execution would entice you to be more forthcoming. Her eyes ignored him entirely with the threat, and she knit together images of her memory to find what she was looking for. I asked, was all she said in reply. I would believe you, he pointed out, if I didn't find you wandering further into palace halls versus escape. She paused, considering things and smiled what would have been a beguiling expression had it not faded as quickly as it was made. I asked very politely. Finding her pace once more, her eyes returned to darting at the walls and ceiling as if finding things amiss or not to her recollection. After a turn, she did inquire of him, however, which was just as curious as his own. Loki Odinson, last in line to the throne of Asgard, how did you come into your reign, even if falsely? I thought I was a liar. There was such mirth in his tone, having her admit having to bend to his version of things. Yet her wit was quick, and gave him little room for the victory as she reminded him, And a hack! I have yet to be shown otherwise, so please. Do try, she said mockingly, words used not days before tossed casually back at him. It was almost like speaking with his brother. There were some scrapes of intelligence to be found, and just like Saul, even he won around once a decade or so. Playing the ruler of Asgard was all grand, and the reverence shown him was much to his desire but there was something to be said about having a remotely engaging conversation. Quite easily. My brother believes nothing is out of place. My mother has passed beyond the realm of caring, and as for the All-Father himself, well, he's resting comfortably. Erica then stopped outside the massive doors of the Great Hall. She turned a quizzical and detailed eye to him, looking him over without any reserve which ended with her displeasure. Say it is true. You have managed all these massive successes. Why then tell me the truth, unless you believe none will believe me, or because you think you are capable of preventing me retelling it? Amused, most entertained, Loki smiled in full. Oh, I don't think I will have any problem stopping you, he said, and she placed her hands on the door, shoving without any aid to open them. Interesting. I was just curious, but it does let me know which one of those you're more concerned over. Coming out as an impostor to the people is not as important as the charade of having power. It must be very boring being you. Struggling against the door, Loki watched as it swing wide, eventually catching on the hinge properly to simply carry without effort. That she had a clever mind was interesting, and to regard for his motives mostly accurate. The hall she walked without fear of retribution, 
and he knew why. Those that may have aided her in her imprisonment were dead, and she did not have a reason yet to fear him out of the misguided assessment that she held secret information that may ruin him. When she stopped inside the inner circle of the great hall, she paused, and he heard the very wind draw out of her lungs. Even the step of her foot became altered, Erica's mind not bent to keeping them quiet. Above, her eyes were trained on a most aged painting of the royal family. Depicted were Odin, Frigg, and both sons, heirs to the throne of Asgard. I admit, I am not much for looking like them, but as you can see, I am family, Loki admits. I didn't deny you because of your looks. There is familiarity in them. Yet, you claim to be a prince of Asgard and heir to the throne of Jodenheim. How did a denizen of that place come to live such a life like you have? She kept going, but her voice had become distant, even as her gaze remained on the painting above. Tell me or don't, I don't think it matters any more. He didn't believe for a second that she wasn't fishing for information, and was so easily satiated. What kind of expression would this relic of the old world think of having a frost giant sit on the throne of Asgard? Wouldn't your head just spin, he thought. Why? Both paused, speaking over the other. He allowed her to continue, however, with a gracious wave of his hand, though he was infinitely more interested in the gear spinning in her head already without added intrigue. Why don't I make this easy? You seem to think I have some sort of power or information that may be useful to you, whether I say so or no. Since I'm vastly years out of the place of the world that exists now, you will answer my questions as honestly as I will answer yours. You may keep your secrets, but they will also cost you mine, your majesty. Better than any agreement he could exploit, Loki found it difficult to excuse what she might exploit of him in turn. Oh, <laughs> I know there is something of import rattling around that currently vacant skull of yours. Let's see if we can't fill it with something useful. She nodded, taking a last glance at the ceiling above before walking out of the grand hall, muttering under her breath in no quieter fashion. To think you have enough information to fill even a saucer would be impressive. He chuckled and followed to see what would next disturb her, with much joy at having something to unravel. The following days showed the final improvements to Erica's health, the last of the thickness in her joints fading and the face she last remembered having looked back in the mirror. She dressed in clothes sent for her, lacking for nothing better to wear, and found an invitation to Odin following shortly after. The contrast to her that exists before the cell and now was stark. She was piecing together the world before exile and to separate it from the delusions made while in it. The ache of having none who remembered her was a soreness in her heart most deeply. She did not expect memory so old could still injure so long after. Time had not eased that pain, but made it more easy to track the path of ruin as it all came rushing to catch up with her. It was those thoughts she buried so as not to be inquired about later, and Erica dressed in form aware that required an assistant to lace so that she might be free. The freedom when finished she was allowed was under the auspice that she remained within the palace walls, and to that she agreed would be acceptable. If she did try to leave, it was because the information found within was no longer more important than being trapped. It was readily agreed upon, however, it was not long that Odin had chosen to fill her freedom for her. My lady, please follow me. Opening the door, an escort awaited to deliver her to Odin. While they had agreed that some dialogue was going to pass between them, it seemed it was going to be on his terms when such moments took place. She thought it was a petty way to display his power, but if that was all he could muster, she could hardly be perturbed. There was many ways to work about this power struggle that seemed to ensue. He had no real way to manipulate her, and she had no method of surprising him when she had nothing of relevance that could pertain to him. What he hoped to garner out of her was nothing more than a child seeking what someone else had, and having a throne already, it seemed, he had grown interested in the cell she was unlucky enough to be placed beside. Now arriving to serve his majesty, 
asked the Lady Erica. Announced into the room like someone of import caused no small moment of unrest. Inside the room, which the doors opened for her, was no small party. There were people talking and some laughing at the entertainment at hand. Welcome, daughter of Asgard. Odin's voice bore through the conversation like a knife, an unease washed over her at being now the centre of attention. As a result, her reply was awkward in response. Your Majesty welcomes me grandly indeed. The honour is beyond my means to express. She bent, about to show her respect, and waited for what she could only guess. She half expected him to say, Do try. She half expected him to say, Do try, and was glad that was not going to be thrown back at her to juggle, because the fact was simple. She may not be dealing with Odin, but royalty nevertheless, and savage enough to pull the guise over everyone, was the sun, Loki, god of mischief. Come, serve me, Loki said, his posture a regal laziness that Odin would never have adopted. Having little option with eyes watching, she did as ordered. She made no quick dash to the table set before Loki. However, though once at the table, she filled a cup and brought it to him. The smile of a small victory was more irritating than anything else. I imagined falsely that we had come to an agreement, you and I. She spoke softly beside him and offered the cup, but he did not extend his hand to take it, leaving her to be its bearer. I intend to keep our bargain, but I do have heirs to keep up, and you'll be getting no real answers about me from the libraries herein. I'm afraid the best lies you'll read there are the ones I told myself. I'm doing you a favour. There was nothing she could bother to ask in a room so well populated, and worse, nothing she wanted to tell. If ages and being forgotten had given nothing, it was a sense of vast privacy to her own affairs. Odin spoke to passing guests, enjoying what entertainment there was to have, while she was left with no place but to stand holding a cup. A number of dances took place, even still after that, and a musical ensemble she couldn't remember anything about after it had ended. It was hours before, tired of holding such a stoic pause, Loki swung large doors open to the guest and begged them enjoy the gardens beyond. He would apparently retire, it would seem, from all of his exhaustive sitting, allowing her to follow. As a servant of the hour, she opened the door to excuse him, bowing in kind, and then entered the room herself. As soon as the door closed, however, she emptied the cup on Loki's back, which flickered and vanished out of existence. My, you didn't think I was actually in attendance, did you? Rather sitting in a chair inside the room, Loki lounged looking most comfortable. He drank from a cup he filled himself, never looking back. Erika stepped around the spilt wine and sat across him, impressed disgust for his trick. Well played, she commented. Don't ruin it by being a good loser. I much prefer beating a willing opponent. His expression showed an amusement she did not share. I am neither an opponent or a servant. I warn you, throwing me into that situation again will not work in your favour. And just why is that exactly? From just your bearing, I can tell a lot about who you must have been before. Some noble lady serving my mother most like. That unfortunately doesn't explain where it was that I found you. So, begin. My time is rather expensive. Erica lipped her lips and did her best to wring the tension from her neck. I suppose it's hardly important, but as you are so pompous to recite them, please endeavour to explain the majesty that is Loki, king of Asgard, and heir to the throne of Jotunheim. No frost giant would sit on the throne and rule his people peacefully. Her insight was not entirely mundane, but it hardly proved to be anything useful to her, so there was no problem with educating her properly. The last time Odin fought with the Frost Giants, they were in fact pushed back to their own realm. The blistering cold there did not support the survival of the weak. I was seen, erroneously, as such. My father, Laufey, discarded me to die of whatever first befell me, which makes me heir apparent, would it not? Intrusive eyes took in details of his form that suddenly paused and then did not resume, she said. 
I have never seen a frost giant so small, nor one so human-looking. I realized wrongly that it was because she had hardly any skin on her then. But you are obviously educated in illusion, so... I will grant it for being plausible for now, she said. And how many have you seen? Loki asked in turn, allowing the conversation to make a more natural course than simply quick pro quo. She answered blandly then. I lived when the frost giants were invading every land they could reach. They had come into Midgard when I was young still, which is when Odin decided it was time to act. I have seen more than a few, and enough to know when I have seen it. And Loki agreed, silent to himself, that she was indeed older than he anticipated. The invasion of the frost giants in Asgard was a very brief affair. How did you survive it, if close enough to know when you've seen one? A tension strung in the air as each was slowly being forced to give up small parts of truth while leaving as much unspoken as possible. It was a fun game for him, but her woeful smile of pity gave him pause. I was not present to witness that particular battle, she claimed, but no lie did she utter. She was much too pleased to be openly lying for that, which led him down a different path to consider while she spoke next. And how did you come to Asgard and its throne? Loki waggled a finger at her inquiry. That's not really one question, is it? However, Odin thought to orchestrate an end to the fighting by taking the sun and raising it as his own. That makes me Prince of Asgard and heir to the throne of Jotunheim, respectively. He ended tersely and probed further her knowledge, its source, and continued. So, having not been present then, how would an Asgardian woman witness my kind? Erica chuckled knowing Loki was not going to like her answer much at all, and responded so dryly it could have chapped lips. Who said anything about me being Asgardian? Now Loki was invested. She was giving more questions back to him to inquire than answers, which was not how he liked to do business. To be clear, I have no problem fighting for scraps like this if you do, or we can be plain. What information we want most will come to light either way, so as long as you can be sure to avoid your calling. Do you think that this is a better option, or would you like to flounder more? I do enjoy watching you fail, but it's hardly fair when I'm many ages your senior. Considering the offer, she was not entirely wrong, if nothing, he would find information out no matter the method. It was merely if he wanted it timely or drawn out like a splinter that had to be gouged out. For the sake of the moment, he ventured with trying the simple way. Very well. Continue your tale, and I will finish mine. Fairly, he added for context. I'm Midgardian. Erica claimed. I was there when the frost giants came and wrought war and painted with others' blood. I was there when their land became cold, and while I was not witness to this, I survived long enough for Odin's efforts to pave a path to survival. Being raised in Asgard yourself, it should seem no surprise that you were considered such, and that it does not change blood. I was born in Midgard, and later raised in Asgard. My parents had been part of a band of travellers to Midgard, and when travelling had been safe. After I was born, we returned to Asgard, save for the one who remained. A chuckle of amusement passed between them. Clever. That would have taken a few more questions to get out. Now finishing my tale. I was raised in Asgard as the son of Odin and Frigg. Years later I learned of my different heritage, and naturally a falling out occurred. It's difficult to keep calling the man that took you hostage father, so rifts formed. Why have you not asked about Frigg? His sudden question, then, was meant to cause disruption, and it did easily, Erica closing her eyes against reason. I have as much information as I need standing before me, and knowing does not change anything, she began. Not how or when or why, so why ask when you will simply use it against me in cruel fashion? Even when willing to answer your questions, you have... You would prefer to maim and cause injury. I will play no part in it. She stood, no longer willing to play with the god of mischief today. She had much to learn about sparring with the adoptive son, and he clearly had skills if he had come so far as he was now. She died not a few months back, you know. 
Loki practically heard the snap of her head when she turned back to look at him. Her fury begged for release in a manner she knew would be meaningless, and likely only end in harm coming to her. Ugh. Her voice broke, but sarcasm loosed a laugh. <laughs> you insolent child. How did Frigg manage to have a child as insolent as you? How ungrateful you are for having her favour. She was not my mother. Loki stood and came around the seat he had sat so quietly, so happily in meting out information from her, and still coming out on top. Yet now she laughed harder, sadder. <laughs> she might not have been your mother. But you don't think I can't see how clearly you were her son? The illusions you use so readily. You don't think I don't recognise your teacher? Poor, poor little Jotun. Despite taking a step away from him, Loki bridged the gap easily with stride and stood over her in height. His words were as cold as the place he was born into. You know nothing of my upbringing and what I have done to come this far. Everyone gives up parts of themselves to claim what they want, and I have given up more than most. Don't feign to be all-knowing when you are nothing but dirt underfoot. Making sure to make his point, his hand easily encased her throat, the length coming out from the sleeve blue and cold around her. You don't have to be a frost giant to stand taller than I. So for the sake of securing my own life here, let me tell you this. You were not the first child raised by her hand that was not her blood. Not the firstborn in any realm, even. The things I know, that Odin has covered up so well, would send a chill even down the back of a frost giant. So before you discard me as useless, or try to have me serve you again, think twice. If you really did hear the contents of my dreams, then you will know I did not fear death. I asked for it. Golden eyes glare into pale eyes that shifted red, blue eating the fleshly colour and revealing marks of Loki's heritage. His fingers tighten as he bent for her to see them more clearly, and to hear his warning. Prove to me that you are so useful, and I will let you live, he warned, as sure nothing could be so important that it would spare him from returning her to a cell to live out all those ages again until she was so worn as when he had found her. Ragnarok is coming, Loki. You choose a sad time to be king. <laughs>